it's time to, we thank once again Jean-Michel, and I think it's time to move to the next speaker, that would be thank Christoph you. Batch. Uh, is he here? Yes, yes, I'm here. Christoph, can you upload the presentation? Or like put on a share your screen, yes? Or uh, Yes, of course. Oh, and then uh, we're just uh, for a brief uh, introduction, Christoph Batch, he got his uh, PhD in uh, physical and theoretical chemistry from the University of Rotswell. And then is now working as a senior fellow and principal investigator in the group of Christian Hook at the University of Innsbruck with a current research that focuses on the application of quantum mechanical methods and artificial intelligence and IR spectroscopy. And as for today, he will speak about nonlinear regression and artificial neural networks and IR spectroscopy. And please, the floor is yours. You have 20 minutes and hopefully leave a couple of minutes for one or two questions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Marie, for a kind introduction. So today, um, I will present um, the following topic, uh, nonlinear regression and artificial neural networks in NIR spectroscopy, insights into fundamental phenomena and impact on practical applications in water-related scenarios. And I would like to mostly focus on uh, miniaturized uh, spectrometers because this uh, truly seems to be the future of NIR spectroscopy. Um, we have just had a very nice session at FitCon conference uh, focused mostly on miniaturized spectroscopy. And there's uh, uh, several pieces of information that should be quite important. For example, Google and Apple, uh, the big tech uh, companies, they are now interested in implementing NIR sensors in the wearables. So um, they want to extend the ability of smart watches, uh, smart bands to uh, monitor not only the uh, usual uh, parameters like uh, heart rate and um, uh, body uh, blood flow, but also to be able to do the chemical analysis of the blood. So uh, in this presentation, I will focus firstly on uh, explaining the role of miniaturized spectrometers in NIR spectroscopy. And then I will highlight some critical differences that appear between the handheld spectrometers and the well-known uh, analytical uh, laboratory bench of, uh, spectroscopy. I will say a few words about the technology behind the miniaturization because I think this is quite essential to understand why these differences are so critical. And then the directly corresponding uh, consequence is the performance versus the miniaturization factor, especially in difficult analysis. And the final um, question that I would like to try to answer here is, can chemometrics help uh, to reduce the difference in the performance to match the laboratory-based NIR spectroscopy? And here, uh, we've seen the application closely related to aquaphotonics. So, the miniaturization of the instrumentation is a general trend. As the technology progresses, uh, we get we got more um, advanced spectrometers. But this trend accelerated accelerated extremely strongly around 2008 with the uh, well-known microphaser spectrometer appearing on the market. And then the following decade um, has seen a truly thrilling um, development of miniaturized instruments. Now, um, quite recent, um, the Avi, the producer of, of Micron AR, uh, now formed um, a consortium that is um, aimed for introducing NR spectrometers directly into, into smartphone. Some details uh, of, of, of this general trend could be found in our uh, recent uh, paper. Now, NIR spectroscopy enjoys quite a uh, um, unique potential here, sorry, um, when it comes to the miniaturization due to the physical principles of NIR spectroscopy and the uh, available optical materials. Quite uh, ex extensively miniaturized and inexpensive at the same time, instruments are uh, possible to be constructed. So um, we see in general the trend of miniaturization in spectrometry um, widely understood, but here NIR spectroscopy is one of the most uh, promising. 
Uh, I think only fluorescence could possibly uh, be comparable, but um, as we all know, NIR spectroscopy has some uh, potent advantages over fluorescence when it comes to the applicability and the chemical specificity. So miniaturization forms a particle synergy with the conventional advantages of NIR spectroscopy, uh, which are the rapid high throughput cost efficient non destructive uh, analysis and applicability to wide selection of samples, including uh, water rich samples. Now, um, miniaturization combines this, uh, those conventional advantages with on site capability. Um, I'm sorry, there was some problem why it's not. Um, I will switch off. Uh, from the presentation view. So uh, for some reason, the animation is, uh, was not played. Um, so the on-site capability means that we can really go with an IR spectroscopy to the field, to the industry, whenever, whenever we want and perform um, a prediction uh, of, of our intended parameter property of, of our sample. And this trend is well reflected by the uh, number of published papers and citations uh, related to the query portable near infrared spectroscopy, uh, according to Web of Knowledge. So, something that needs to be uh, strongly emphasized is the difference between the uh, mature design of. Uh, an IR spectrometer, which is quite similar also to, to IR. Often uh, there are instruments that can measure both regions. So we have, of course, the Fourier transform um, design uh, with Michelson inter interferometer, which mostly dominated the market right now. 99% of instruments, uh, benchtop instruments are, are uh, well, present almost the same design scheme. Uh, there are some differences, of course. Mostly, most of them have the Nicholson interferometer with the moving mirror that creates the path difference, but there are also um, polarization-based uh, interferometers. For example, our BHE and our FLEX uh, instrument in our lab has this uh, interferometer, which offers some um, advantages when it comes to compactness uh, of, of the design and the stability as well. So, and this is uh, in stark contrast to uh, miniaturized spectrometers. Unlike this, this um, truly um, set in stone scheme of, of FT, IR, and IR instrument with Michelson interferometer, we have a true competition of different design principles in an IR uh, miniaturized spectrometer. So, for example, the mentioned uh, microphasers phase zero use the uh, programmable Hadamard mask. So it is in fact a Hadamard uh, spectrometer where a Hadamard transform is used instead of Fourier transform to recover the, uh, the frequency spectrum. And um, here this instrument use uh, now quite well, well known popular uh, model or, or technology of manufacturing um, Electro uh, mechanical and optical systems, which is uh, NEMS, um, they allow to use uh, the fabrication methods known from um, processor uh, integrated circuitry uh, manufacturing uh, processes, where directly in silicon we can uh, we can manufacture um, mechanical and uh, optical systems in microscale. Micron IR uh, from Viabi, for example, also very well known and well performing instrument, presents a completely different uh, design uh, scheme. This is a multi channel uh, spectrometer, quite um, rare solution because it involves uh, the <clears throat> um, RI detector with uh, this, in this case, in, if with uh, 128. Um, uh, pixels. So this is a, an expensive detector, but combined with the quite inexpensive linear variable filter, it allows to measure exactly those 128 
spectral points at the same moment, at the same time, simultaneously. It offers the optical throughput advantage even better than Fourier transform or the energies along, along the entire wavelength axis are passed through the uh, detector. Um, so it's quite, quite different uh, design principle from any of, of uh, benchtop spectrometers. We have also uh, some instruments here. This is the uh, DLP MIR scan module from Texas Instruments, which is a design scheme analog analogous to a dispersive uh, spectrometer with the difference that in a dispersive, conventional dispersive spectrometer, um, we have a moving diffraction grating. It rotates um, and passes different uh, light uh, wavelengths through a slit. Here, this fragment is, is fixed. Uh, um, and the role of the moving grating is um, played by a digital uh, micro -mi uh, mirror array. Uh, which is again a MEMS um, um, technology, uh, MEMS element, where uh, moving uh, array of um, mirrors uh, can do the, <clears throat> the selection of the particular wavelength, and which is then pro uh, projected onto a single element detector. We have also um, Fabry Perot principle, which is an optical filter using the interference and passes through only only selected uh, wavelengths. And then we have also Fourier transform instruments. The first generation of Fourier transform instruments, um, well, they were not uh, the best choice unlike for bench of uh, spectrum, uh, spectroscopy. In miniaturization, um, the principle of, of uh, Mikkelsen interferometer faced some limitations. Now we are uh, seeing uh, appearing on the market in next generation of, of Fourier transform uh, devices. For example, this one is just uh, becoming available uh, commercially. This is a um, nano FTIR NIR uh, instrument from Southness Technology FA China. And it uses um, a large mirror uh, in the construction of the Michelson interferometer large in relation to the previous designs. Um, one of the quite uh, pronounced uh, advantages here is that unlike most of the other instruments, including those with Mikkelsen interferometer, this instrument can observe the entire conventionally um, uh, understood NIR region from uh, above uh, 12,500 centimeters down to below 4,000. So, um, as I mentioned, the most obvious difference uh, in the between the different uh, instruments resulting from the uh, this different design principles uh, is the non-equal different uh, spectral region that they observe. So, for example, microphase you observe quite narrow spectral region. Micro and IR uh, 2,200 is uh, extensive, um, but not fully. For example, this region, which is um, uh, quite useful for water analysis, moisture content analysis is not observed here. So um, this is also a screen showing the difference of between the instruments uh, beyond the um, uh, most obvious difference in the observed spectral region. We have also the difference in the resolution and the signal to noise ratio. We have uh, recently investigated this uh, particular case, the signal to noise ratio, and what we have learned was uh, quite unexpected, quite shocking, that the uh, differences between the signal to noise, noise, noise ratio and the nominal one measured against the white reference, so that the industry standard, the RMS uh, noise, how it is uh, typically advertised, um, when faced with the true um, or when, when doing the true measurement of the sample, where we have uh, less light uh, being reflected by, back to the detector, this can be quite um, a huge difference between the spectrometers. Some of them retain more of this uh, capability to, to still um, um, record uh, uh, 
denoised or, or not affected by noise, the spectra, and for some other, uh, it's quite uh, different. Um, so let's take a look at the example of, of NRL bands uh, piperine and which vibrations can different spectrometers see. Okay, um, I'm sorry for some reason it's uh, it's not played um, as it should. Um, the animation is not uh, not shown, but um, I hope that the, the resolution is uh, good enough. Uh, the screen, maybe not. This will be a bit better. Um, so, what we see here uh, is the uh, band assignments of piperine available from our quantum chemical calculations, which we also do uh, in Russell Hook uh, group here in Innsbruck, and. Here we uh, only want to show um, this particular difference. So Behe, the benched of spectrometer uh, that has uh, observed the, the entire uh, region, uh, of course, can acquire the information from all the bands. But when you see the um, microphasier and the micro NIR, um, so as you can see, these instruments um, for example, micro and completely um, lacks the ability to see uh, the most intense uh, combination bands, uh, the most intense absorption region of Piper in here. So we can see the combinations here. Uh, the spectrum is uh, entirely dominated by, <clears throat> uh, by these bands. They are completely unavailable. Um, so Now the question is, um, can we, is this a problem in real life analysis in particular? Uh, something related to uh, cofotomics, the moisture content analysis in plant material. Uh, is this a problem? And if it is, uh, can it be somehow improved? So um, in this study, we used uh, two bench top spectrometers, BHE and RFLEX and 500 and Brooker MPA and three miniaturized instruments, two versions of micro and IR, the older one, the prototype unit, and the newer one, uh, 1700 ES. Uh, there are some differences. They use different detector. Uh, and also this one has a cooled, uh, I'm sorry, it's not cooled. It has a software uh, temperature correction function, function that uh, takes into account the, the changed um, detector uh, response uh, affected by the temperature and the mentioned microphasier. So these five uh, instruments were used to measure 192 powdery samples of dry plant extracts, um, which are listed here with consistent composition. Um, they were um, divided into two sets. Uh, half were measured, uh, analyzed in native form, and the half, other half was dry, uh, laced by the drain, drying agent, which is the how the uh, industry uh, solves the problem of, of, uh, of varying moisture. Um, but when it comes to the analysis itself, um, let's say uh, the benefits from being able to analyze in native uh, forms uh, is there. The difference analysis were performed by, uh, by Carl Fischer titration. Um, sorry, this is of course a mistake uh, here. Uh, the spectral measurements uh, and the pre-treatments were uh, as, uh, as listed. So these are the exemplary spectra of uh, the um, plant extracts uh, measured by different spectrometers. So um, for example, here for micro IR, we see some drop in, in, in intensity. So clearly uh, this region may be unreliable and in fact, it's better to remove it from uh, the subsequent analysis. We can see also some other differences beyond just the baseline sheet. Uh, but uh, what is important here that when we use um, the most commonly used uh, PLS regression, um, firstly, um, we see that the performance uh, for native samples uh, drops. So uh, those that are not uh, laced, not idealized by uh, using the drying agent uh, show some difficulty related, well, difficult to say, but the complex matrix and um, varying uh, water content could be probably a factor. 
Uh, the second thing is, um, this was uh, something that we, we noticed from, from uh, several of our analyses that uh, PLS uh, strongly benefits from extensive pretreatment, not extensive by the number of pretreatments, but uh, let's say for a selection of the optimal approach. So typically we perform several analyses and several treatments, chemometric treatments and pretreatments to select the, the best performing. So pre-selection of wave numbers, uh, different uh, normalization uh, approaches. Finally, uh, the derivative and smoothing. So in fact, this required a lot of work. Now, we uh, then uh, thought that especially this was, uh, I will go back, this was particularly obvious for uh, miniaturized instruments. They are for several uh, reasons, more challenging, more um, problematic to, per, to make them perform very well uh, when it comes to the analysis. Narrower wave number region, lesser number of spectral points, for example, Micron IR only records uh, the older version 128, the newer one, and just 125. So, low number of spectral points and low resolution uh, uh, are also a problem. A low number of spectral points also, let's say, uh, limits us in the possibility of, of applying pretreatments. We need to be careful with this. So we uh, were seeking for some method that could be, um, first of all, would perhaps allow us to improve the performance. And the second thing that would uh, require less uh, trial and error approaches for miniaturized instruments. So the method that would be more uh, better performing for uh, those more difficult cases. We tried Gaussian process regression, which is a very important uh, method. Uh, sadly, not that popular in NIR spectroscopy yet. And we also used uh, feedforward artificial neural network uh, with uh, uniform um, uh, topology, uh, with a uh, varying number of uh, hidden layers. So uh, by comparing now the, the results, the final results of this, we see that for the, uh, those uh, more ideal samples, indeed, um, and for the more ideal benchtop spectrometers, PLS are works well. And this is something that studying literature, we can see that mostly PLS at least perform very well. Sometimes uh, the best, sometimes uh, other uh, calibrations are better, but uh, seldomly uh, they are uh, much better than PLS. And this is the picture that we observe. Thanks Sorry to here. interrupt, but you almost, you already ran out of time. So you should try to go quickly to the conclusion. Yeah, this is, uh, mm -hmm, thank you. This is, this is just last, uh, one of the last slides, uh, actually uh, just two more. So. Um, what I wanted to uh, show here is that uh, when we go um, into, into more um, challenging uh, case of the uh, miniaturized instruments, um, the PLS uh, loses this advantage. And now um, the most general uh, observation here is that uh, artificial neural networks tend to perform uh, better, the best, but require more supervision again. Uh, with a uh, different number of um, hidden neural layers, while GPR can be applied almost um, without any risk um, and can guarantee uh, at least very good um, performance. And also here, this is the difference, the, the, the penalty that uh, can be seen uh, when going from the native samples to the um, drying agent uh, treated samples. So for those methods, uh, the penalty is lower. So not only for the um, going from benchtop to an, uh, miniaturized instrument, but also for uh, the more challenging uh, sample type. So, um, well, because of the time, I will just briefly summarize. So, um, 
these methods, uh, there is uh, potential for chemo matrix to address, to reduce this, this penalty to the performance uh, present for my miniaturized uh, and our spectrometers. And in our case, uh, it was so good that the performance basically uh, was equal to uh, benchtop spectroscope. Thank you for your attention. So thanks a lot for your presentation. Uh, and unfortunately, as I told, uh, you used all your time and a uh, little bit further. So unless there are very stringent and very quick question, yes, yes, Uniana, please. please. Um, I have a, a question and comment. Um, I think all the all of those instruments were dispersive, right? Um, could you please comment on the difference between predispersive and dispersive instruments in infrared in general? Um, mm -hmm. And have you looked at the accuracy and comparison between these two types of instruments? Because um, I've been working most of my, of course, I use the Buchi and Brooker and uh, many different instruments, but and also mm, most of the work is done with XDS and infrared systems, which is predispersive. What do you think about this? And uh, maybe that it could be a good discussion point for the whole co community because it's uh, uh, when we look at the water and when we want to know more about water, which um, uh, we should have a, a, an opinion about which is better. Okay, um, when it comes to water analysis, I will start maybe from your last uh, question. When it comes yes. to water analysis, I would say primarily what matters yeah. is the observed spectral region. So they, they differ much by the observed spectral region. So this is the primary difference here. Difference. Yeah, okay. Some of them will, will see uh, water bands, uh, some of them uh, will not. For the water analysis, for example, in food stuff, uh, in general, in, in, in complex matrices, uh, short wave and IR region is the preferred. So from the instruments that I showed here, none of them observes this region. Um, now, going back to, to your first question, actually, none of them, not, not a single instrument here was dispersing. So BHE is actually FT and IR Fourier transform yeah, okay. with so, yeah. polarizer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. what, and, I, and, yeah. what, I, what I meant is, um, it, uh, if you introduce to the sample single wave wavelength um, light, or you, you introduce to the sample white white, and then you uh, divide it by wavelengths afterwards. This, this is the big difference in, in, uh, in what I'm making the point now. Okay. Um, yeah, well, um, I'm, I'm not sure if I understood the question. Um, um, okay, when you take a spectrum, mm -hmm. um, uh, I, the common view is that uh, every other spectrum taken by this particular instrument should be absolutely the same. And when you start working with the water, you realize that this is not the case. Okay. Because, um, so we, we this conference, we, we talked a lot about coherence, quantum calculations, all these plays. So we have interaction between water and light and water changes after the first measurement. So you will never get the second uh, measurement the same as the previous one. So I, I think even Heinz Sislo now understands that. So now the point is that when, when you introduce to the sample, lambda one, lambda two from 400 nanometers to 2,500 nanometers upward, um, you take the one by one. So it means that you, you get water influenced by 400 nanometers and then 402 and four and six and so it depends on the step, right? Um, if you illuminate your sample with white light with all the wavelengths together, that then the effect on the sample will be different. Mm -hmm. So this is my point. OK. Yeah. Um, Maybe people usually don't take care of this. And um, they don't think I, about this. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah well, this is something that we talked 
together about yeah, yeah. it. And this yeah. is quite fascinating. Um, not, I mean, I don't want to, to steal too much time, but I will just mention, I mean, your question is very, very much relevant here. So micro and I would be the best one. This is a multi-channel uh, spectrometer, which means that it measures all the spectra, all yeah. the spectral points at the same time. So if there's any over time development of some perturbation due to irradiation of water, a uh, multi-channel spectrometer will be the best. There is no scanning at all. In principle, you can obtain all the wave numbers within milliseconds. Yes, uh, I, yeah, I've, luckily I've worked with the micro and I. It, it, absolutely mm -hmm. right, I saw the results, is very good. This is, mm -hmm, this I, is just, mm -hmm. Yeah, but there is one thing that probably not, not many people know that um, for micro, uh, no, the infrared system instrument, the old one, uh, and now it is XDS and um, um, called the XDS. They, the, the, the spectrum that we get at the end of each sample is an average of the spectrum uh, taken upwards when you start from 400 nanometer to 25 and, and the other one from 25 to 400 because Carl Norris found the difference between these two spectra. And they, they calculate the, different, the, the average and this is what we get as, as, as this spectra of the sample. Um, and, uh, and I think when lots of information we can obtain just by using a predispersive um, instrument or like, for example, if a micro NR was not a filter instrument, the kind of filter instrument. So you, you have a halogen lamp goes to, to your sample and then uh, the, the, uh, the light coming out of your sample is uh, divided, right? Mm -hmm. By the filter. So, um, or maybe if there is an instrument that can do both of this, will be very, very informative for the water. This is what, what just I was thinking. And uh, uh, well, it is a good discussion for our 